sit, where, sit wherever you want, and I'll recognize you in the order that I was going to recognize you, regardless of your seats. It's like musical chairs. We have enough chairs for each of you. And uh, if you can find the open one, it will be very helpful to us. We thank you all very much for being here, and uh, we apologize uh, for the delay. Um, this is obviously a very important issue. Uh, we may be writing the uh, transmission rules for the next generation of uh, electricity generation in our country over the next uh, couple of weeks. We'll see if that can be accomplished. Perhaps it can, perhaps we can't, but uh, your testimony is going to be central to accomplishing that goal. We could not do it without your participation. We apologize uh, to you for the delay in your panel being recognized and for it being uh, Friday afternoon, getting later as the minutes um, transpire. We'll begin with uh, Ralph Izzo. He is Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of the Public Service Enterprise Group Incorporated. He is a leader within the utility industry uh, and the public policy area. We thank you once again for being here. Mr. Izzo, whenever you're ready, please begin. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity. Could you move that microphone in just a little bit closer? Sure. Thank you for this opportunity to appear before you today to testify. PSEG distributes electricity and natural gas to more than 2 million customers in New Jersey and owns and operates electric generating capacity in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, and Texas. PSEG has long supported policies to promote renewable generation. We are planning major investments in solar, offshore wind generation, and an energy storage technology that will make renewable energy more competitive. The question today is not whether we should vigorously promote renewable generation, but how. Specifically, how should we use transmission policy to promote renewable generation at the lowest possible cost? This would include not just federal siting authority, but decisions about transmission planning and cost allocation that are fundamental to determining how much transmission is built and where. There are two competing views on this. One view, which I strongly favor, is that government should establish prices for externalities, such as the cost of emitting greenhouse gases, and let market forces determine which technologies and which locations are most promising for investment. This is the approach taken in the landmark ACES legislation. It establishes a price for carbon through a cap and trade program and a market-based subsidy for renewable generation through the renewable electricity standard. With these price signals, developers can compare the costs of renewable generation in different locations, including the associated transmission costs. The alternative view is that some central entity should plan and site transmission that will connect areas with strong renewable resources to areas of high electric demand via some green transmission superhighway paid for by a broad group of taxpayers. Under this model, government would essentially pick winning renewable technologies and locations and build transmission to facilitate them. I have several concerns about this approach. First, it could lead to unnecessarily expensive outcomes. All business owners know that if they establish their factory at a distant location to keep production costs down, they have to weigh that against shipping costs. But if we socialize shipping costs of renewable generation, we skew decisions away from locally based options that may have a lower total cost. That is why a bipartisan coalition of 10 Northeastern governors wrote to Congress warning that this policy would undermine their efforts to grow renewable industries. Moreover, building thousands of miles of transmission lines in anticipation of the arrival of renewable generation may lead to an expensive excess of transmission capacity. Transmission planning is a deliberate process meant to respond to long-term reliability and economic concerns. It is not intended to predict and facilitate dynamic markets. Second, 
as has been said so many times already, there is no such thing as a green transmission line. Transmission lines carry all electrons without regard to the carbon footprint of the generator. In fact, the dispatchability of renewable resources would suggest you would have a significant underutilization of the transmission line unless you filled it with other forms of generation. So a green transmission line will give market advantage to any power plant fortunate enough to be close, close to the new line. Third, creating a new planning process across regions is unnecessary. We already have regional planning processes that are effective and sensitive to local concerns. Cross-regional issues should be addressed through improved coordination between regional planning bodies, which is exactly the approach taken in the committee passed bill. Finally, existing tools can help renewable projects connect to the grid without distorting locational price signals and without potentially burdening customers with an excess of expensive transmission. For example, if the cost of connecting to the grid and getting power to market are too much for one developer to bear, multiple developers can share costs among their projects. Or FERC can require that ratepayers initially bear these costs, provided they are reimbursed by developers after the projects become operational. In closing, I believe we will meet our long-term carbon reduction goals. But sitting here today, I cannot tell you what renewable technologies and more importantly, in what locations it will take to get us there to serve our customers at the lowest possible cost. And neither can government. That is why I strongly support policies such as an RES and carbon pricing that send price signals to the market and unleash the creativity and entrepreneurial spirit of the American people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Izzo, very much. Our next witness is Joe Nipper, who is the senior Vice President for Governmental Affairs of the American Public Power Association, representing the nation's more than 2,000 community-owned electric utilities. Uh, we thank you for being here. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the subcommittee. appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, APPA, as you mentioned, represents the interests of 2,000 publicly owned uh, uh, state and locally owned utilities across the country, collectively serving 45 million Americans. 110 public power utilities collectively own about 8 percent of the nation's transmission lines of 138 kilovolts or greater. However, the great majority of APPA's members are transmission dependent, that is, dependent on facilities owned by others in order to acquire the electricity they need for distribution to their retail customers. Our members report that more transmission is needed in almost every area of the country to serve a variety of purposes, including increased use of renewable energy, uh, reliability, and to enhance competition. In our view, the single most uh, significant impediment to getting new transmission built continues to be siting, and we urge Congress to clarify and continue to support the federal backstop siting authority included in EPACT 05. The EPACT 05 siting authorities were a major step forward but have been called into a question by the recent, the, uh, by the recent uh, court decision in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, as an intervener uh, on the side of FERC in this case, uh, APPA believes that legislation should clarify the original congressional intent in EPAC 05 by expressly providing FERC with the authority to consider backstop transmission siting applications when a state denies an application. It's important to note for us that as units of local and state government, public power uh, utilities are not typically supportive of federal policy that diminishes state authority, and we certainly have had concerns about Congress and FERC's attempt to expand that authority in other areas. However, the importance of citing new interstate transmission lines cannot be understated, and thus our continued support of the compromise called uh, crafted in EPACT 05. There is some misconception, though, that higher voltage lines are always better. In actuality, the interconnected nature of the grid is such that a lower voltage line, if located strategically, could have a greater ability to relieve congestion and to enhance reliability than a higher voltage line and could experience uh, <clears throat> less local resistance to the siting and cost less than a higher voltage line. Of course, there are situations where higher voltage lines is preferable and necessary, but we want to make it clear that bigger is not always better when it comes to the grid. This is one reason why regional planning is so important. The impact of proposed new higher voltage facilities on the existing transmission network needs to be fully considered so that the optimal mix of facilities can be determined. Encouraging proportional joint ownership of transmission facilities by load serving entities, including public power utilities in a given region, is another way to get more transmission built. 
If the responsibility for building and owning the transmission grid is spread more broadly among the entities serving customers in a region, then joint transmission planning will be facilitated simply because there are more project uh, more participants at the planning table supporting the needed projects. If network customers of a dominant regional transmission provider are encouraged to own their load ratio share of the transmission system, transmission usage and ownership will be more closely aligned and the friction between transmission dependent utilities and transmission owners can be reduced. There are many examples, Mr. Chairman, where that is the case. With respect to planning, APPA supports the transmission planning provisions, including the committee passed version of the American Clean Energy and Security Act, as we believe that they will bolster rather than duplicate or further complicate the existing and extensive transmission planning process under FERC Order 890 occurring at the regional and sub-regional levels across the country. The manner in which transmission facilities costs are allocated among generators, transmission owners, transmission dependent utilities and other stakeholders is one of the most controversial topics related to transmission. APPA strongly supported the language included in EPAC that underscores FERC's flexibility in determining the appropriate transmission pricing methodology. We don't always agree with the decisions made by FERC on cost allocation. We continue to believe that Congress had it right in leaving these decisions with appropriate stakeholder input and administrative due process to FERC to determine under Sections 205 and 206 of the Federal Power Act. The issue of who pays for transmission facilities provides regional benefits is a difficult one, says such facilities can provide present and future system benefits and extend well beyond the specific entities for whom the facilities are constructed. Therefore, APP, urge, APP urges FERC to provide greater guidance on cost allocation for new major transmission facilities that afford regional benefits. APPA does not support the allocation of uh, costs of facilities to, sub, to regions, subregions, or entities that will receive little or no benefit from the facilities and therefore opposes a federal statutory requirement to allocate such costs on an interconnection-wide basis. And lastly, Mr. Chairman, APPA has concerns with respect to a FERC's application of its incentive rate authority provided under EPAC 05. FERC seems to regard Section 219 as a statutory requirement to offer a variety of different transmission incentives to applicants, and it appears that these entities have been helping themselves to those incentives, and that the Commission has not taken a sufficiently disciplined approach to awarding rate incentives. We appreciate your long-held concern in this area and your recent letter to FERC asking for an explanation of their use of their incentives, and we look forward to their response and to working with the Chairman on that issue. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Uh, Mr. Nipper, very much, and I appreciated the very diplomatic way in which you used the word entity in your testimony. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, our next witness is uh, Glenn English. Uh, he is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. Um, but uh, more significantly, uh, he served in the United States Congress for 10 terms as one of our most distinguished members. And uh, it's our honor to have you back before the subcommittee. Uh, Glenn, whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. I'm not sure my board of directors would uh, agree with uh, the more significantly, but uh, I appreciate that and understand uh, uh, where you're coming from on that. That's we can. We can. I think the one thing that the board and I can share in common is that we'll each um, d reserve to ourselves which think which of us believes that you had a more important job. Well, I, I and, just appreciate uh, both of you thinking I have an important the, the, the fact that you are so important to both of us, I think, is very important. <laughs> You're very kind, Mr. Chairman. Yourself. I appreciate that. As I think the members of the committee know, electric cooperatives are consumer-owned. Uh, we're in 47 states across the country. And uh, we serve, however, 7% uh, of the population uh, through about three-quarters of the land mass of the United States. So when we talk about transmission and when we talk about uh, the fact that uh, uh, you're talking about generating renewable energy in this country. It's most likely going to come from areas that are served by electric cooperatives. So we have a big stake in that. Uh, we plan to have a, a big part of the future as we move forward in that uh, general direction. Could you just repeat that number again? Seven percent of the customers, but what We've percent? got three quarters of the land mass. Okay, thank you. And uh, it's all owned by those individual consumers that uh, throughout those uh, 47 states, Mr. Chairman. Uh, also, I think we can all agree that uh, uh, the signing of uh, the American Clean Energy and Security Act of 2009 is going to bring about a, a profound change in the way that uh, 
uh, not only energy is generated in this country, but the way that we use energy in this country. It's going to change our lives. And uh, with that understanding, I hope that uh, we can also recognize that uh, we've got to be prepared for that kind of a dramatic change. And the transmission system as it exists today was certainly not designed for this kind of change. In fact, it wasn't, uh, wasn't designed for the 19 1992 Energy Act with uh, the deregulation on the wholesale level. So we're still trying to adjust to that. What we would suggest, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, uh, we need a sense of urgency here. And uh, certainly uh, we need transmission as a part of this act. It needs to be addressed in this act. And as a result of that, uh, we think there's some, some very basic principles that need to be incorporated as you move forward with any kind of, of legislative language as it applies uh, uh, to um, uh, this new transmission system, new transmission policy that the country is going to be following. As I think uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have established now a national renewable cooperative so each cooperative in every one of those 47 states can participate in, a, uh, in any renewable project in any part of that uh, three quarters of the land mass of the United States. So a wind project in uh, South Dakota, for instance, uh, may be invested by people from uh, Wisconsin, co-ops from Wisconsin, or they may be from Alabama or Georgia or wherever. Uh, they can own a piece of that. And uh, what we're looking for is a way in which we can generate uh, that power through renewables in the most efficient way possible, no matter where it's located. Uh, we should be looking for the most cost-effective way in which we can do that. And uh, just as we know that certain wind corridors exist uh, that will provide us with a great uh, amount of production of uh, wind energy uh, throughout the Great Plains, not every farm's the same, not every state's the same, um, that uh, we also then uh, have got to make sure that uh, when we locate that kind of generation in those areas that we can move that power out of those regions. So we need an efficient and effective transmission system to do it. But we also, I think, have to be very aware of the fact that, uh, and it's been our experience, that bottom-up planning uh, works the best. Uh, so you need local, regional planning. You need local folks putting this plan together to determine what's the best way to move forward on this. And uh, so that uh, is a principle I think we need to adhere to, a bottom up rather than top down, as far as planning the transmission system of this country. I would also suggest that uh, uh, under these conditions, uh, and given the fact that we're going to have to move uh, in this more efficient transmission system, we're going to have to move uh, that transmission across state lines, uh, that we may run into difficulties and encumbrances. We may run into delays that, quite frankly, the national, nat national best interest is not being served. So uh, I think we've got to, uh, while we're having that local planning, we've got to also make sure that we don't have impediments put in the way that is going to pre prevent that local planning from being implemented. We've got to make sure that the overall national policy of moving across state lines is dealt with. And for that reason, we do think that uh, there is going to have to be some authority on the federal level as far as citing is concerned. Uh, but again, it uh, should be uh, uh, focused on certain uh, qualifiers. Uh, as we look at, uh, at that siting authority. First of all, uh, should be facilities that are only identified on regional planning. Should be facilities that uh, are interstate projects. Uh, it should be, in, in fact, uh, uh, the owners of those facilities uh, uh, should not be eligible for enhanced rates or any other financial incentives as far as where they're building uh, that transmission. And the cost of the facility should be fairly and broadly allocated uh, along with uh, the use of, uh, of the facilities uh, should not be limited to just one kind of power, should not just be renewables only. And that's being because of the fact that uh, laws of physics, as we've heard expressed here today, uh, doesn't distinguish between uh, electrons. They're all the same once they get into that transmission system. And we'd also suggest that the law in which uh, we're proposing this become a part of uh, would in fact itself dictate uh, the direction that we would be manufacturing or generating those particular electrons. Also, uh, we would suggest that it needs to be broad, fair cost allocation. 
Uh, we think that's a very important point. Uh, obviously, those of us who are electric cooperatives are very, very sensitive about that. We would have uh, a few people, and all the costs being dumped on those few people would be unbearable. So it should be allocated on the basis of who's getting the benefit, who are the folks that uh, are receiving the benefits of, of that, en of that uh, energy that uh, is being generated and produced. Also. Uh, uh, we would uh, uh, suggest, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, uh, we move forward and, and recognize the fact that there are more benefits uh, to building such a transmission system across this country or in different areas of this country than just uh, the movement of that power. Uh, the the right-of-ways for any kind of transmission like that would become extremely valuable. And it would also be a way in which uh, it would, in fact, become a new technologies right away, ways in which you could move new technologies. And I know you're particularly interested in the smart grid. And obviously, there are many uses that uh, it could be incorporated into uh, any new transmission system along those lines. Uh, fiber to, between the towers is obviously another way in which we can uh, make good use of, of that transmission system. So, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, suggest to you that uh, that we need a new transmission system to go along uh, uh, with the legislation that's being proposed. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Glenn, very much. Our uh, next witness is uh, Reed uh, uh, Dechon. He is executive director of the Energy Future Coalition, a nonprofit organization that uh, seeks to reform uh, U.S. energy policy. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for inviting me to testify today on this important and timely topic. Uh, I find a great deal of agreement uh, across the table and particularly with uh, Congressman English. Uh, uh, last year, in partnership with the Center for American Progress and the Energy Foundation, the Energy Future Coalition undertook a series of listening sessions with a diverse group of stakeholders, including federal agencies, grid operators, transmission companies, utilities, and environmental groups. And we found broad support for changes in federal law to facilitate the transmission needed to bring stranded renewable resources to market. Wind in the Great Plains, solar in the desert southwest, and yes, offshore wind in the east. Our vision statement for the National Clean Energy Smart Grid, which is attached to my full statement, was endorsed by some 55 organizations, including the AFL-CIO, the Council on Competitiveness, and the Digital Energy Solutions Campaign, along with many renewable energy advocates and environmental groups, including the Sierra Club, who are not usually prone to supporting new transmission capacity. What brought these environmental groups to the table, and ultimately to agreement, was the imperative of action to address with urgency the growing climate crisis. Time is running out for the world to avoid serious harm from climate change. Mr. Chairman, you understand this challenge very well, and we owe a great debt of gratitude to you and Chairman Waxman for your leadership and acumen in advancing H.R. 2454, uh, the American Clean Energy and Security Act. You have set the appropriate long-term target for emissions reductions more than 80 percent by 2050. The changes in our energy system needed to reach this goal are profound. We need to begin planning today to reach those reductions by 2050. And one thing is clear, we cannot deliver that much low carbon energy without changes to the grid. Low carbon electricity will be expected to power not only our homes and businesses, but also an increasing portion of our vehicle fleet. The system we have today for planning, permitting, and financing transmission lines was not designed to respond quickly to a challenge of this magnitude, moving many thousands of megawatts of renewable energy from remote areas to load centers. Our discussions with those who must deliver on this promise, renewable energy developers and transmission companies, quickly focused on the obstacles of planning, siting, and cost allocation that we've heard repeatedly today. Of these, planning turned out to be the linchpin, as our group concluded that better planning could reduce the difficulty of siting and financing new lines. We recommended enlarging the scale of the planning process to the two principal power grids in the United States, the eastern and western interconnections, for two reasons. First, long distance transmission is needed to support development of some major renewable energy resources and necessarily will cross state and regional boundaries. For example, almost 300,000 megawatts, an enormous amount of wind, 
of 300,000 megawatts of proposed wind projects, which is more than enough to meet 20 percent of our electricity needs, are waiting to connect to the grid because there is inadequate transmission capacity to carry the electricity they would produce. Second, planning for transmission to support the renewable energy standards and state and federal legislation must occur on a broad regional basis, just as the benefits of such investments will be shared on a broad regional basis. Your discussion of the impact of wind resources in the East is a good illustration of the need for planning across the entire interconnection. An enhanced regional planning process of this kind should build on, not replace, the current engagement of stakeholders including states, grid operators, utilities, consumer and environmental interests, and landowner groups. This will remain a state, not a federal process. Citing authority would rest with FERC, but the states collectively would have more power, not less, than they do now because their plans would govern the exercise of that federal authority. Only if the planning process breaks down would FERC have the ability to resolve disputes and get transmission built to, to bring renewable energy to market. We have been gratified to see many of our recommendations reflected in H.R. 2211, introduced by Congressman Inslee, a system of interconnection-wide transmission planning supported by broad-based cost <coughs> allocation and underpinned by federal siting authority. And we would be pleased to work with the committee uh, on further legislative language if you think that would be helpful. Mr. Chairman, you and your colleagues have taken an enormous step forward by reporting legislation that will begin the process of transforming our nation's energy system to deal with the threat of global climate change. Expanding and modernizing our transmission grid is essential to that transformation. By addressing transmission directly and comprehensively, you can help our common goal of a clean energy future become a reality and not be left stranded by regulatory impediments. Our economy, environment, and national security deserve no less. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our next uh, witness is Joseph Welsh, Chairman and President and Chief Executive uh, Officer of ITC Holdings. Uh, that is the nation's first independent transmission company. We welcome you, sir. Please begin. Thank you and good afternoon. Could you move that microphone in a little bit closer and turn it on? Thank you and good afternoon, Chairman Markey and members of the subcommittee. Uh, as the Chairman said, my name is Joseph Welch. I'm Chairman, CEO, and President of ITC Holdings, the nation's first and only independent transmission company in the United States. Being independent means that we are not affiliated with any market participant. We have no ownership or have any uh, dealings in energy transactions. Our job is to facilitate the market, to facilitate the interconnection of any sources of generation uh, that are put before us and to make sure that we connect the loads and reliably do so. We own and operate about, about 15,000 miles of high voltage lines in Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois, Missouri, Michigan and are developing regional transmission projects in Kansas and Oklahoma. As we have worked through these various states, uh, each time we come to the point where we need to build transmission for whatever reason, we have come up against a set of obstacles, each one different in a st every state. Uh, probably that is as it should be, but when we get to the outcome of where we went, want to go in this country, uh, this is going to become a major impediment for us to move forward as a country who dearly and necessarily needs to seek energy independence. I brought with me today a, a report from the Council on Competitiveness and Energy Sustainability, which I believe is a good framework, and I will leave it with you to all for you to read. I think it, it's, it offers a lot of information, which is very consistent with the very principles and, and items that you're considering here. But going to the fundamental principles that we need, and at the top of the list, and I want to go right to the top of the list, we need a policy for energy in this country. We've talked about all the things underneath and we debate about whether it's right or wrong, but the fundamental issue is that we need a policy and something to plan to. With that policy in place, the rest of the items become a lot clearer and a lot more succinct, and a lot of the debates that we hear from all of us who really are closer than further apart really start to come together. For instance, with a policy, then the planners, and when I say the planners, and we have talked about this in the item that I support, 
and my company supports is that we need an independent planning authority. We need to take the policy and get the policy implemented in a very clear and succinct way. Secondly, if you have the policy, then the cost allocation can be dictated by the policy itself, meaning that from that policy, we now know where we want to go, we now know who are the benefactors and what those benefactor issues are. And so that policy sits at the top and we need that. And last but not least, when we get down to the very bones, um, I always tell people being in the transmission business, it's a great business until I do one of two things. And the first item is build new transmission lines. The minute we start to build them, it becomes a nightmare. And the process is, is hard and it's long. And what we need is true federal backstop siding authority. That is not meant to cut the states out of the process. The state should be involved in the process. They are the most knowledgeable about local issues. But at the end of the day, we have to get a regional transmission grid built. As I've, you've heard here, there are literally thousands and upon thousands of megawatts of renewable energy that this country needs to deploy, and we need to deploy it now. And if we start now, we are years and years away from our goal line. So please, uh, let's, let's have this conclusion and bring it to it. And I thank you very much for my opportunity to speak here today. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. Our next witness is Christopher Miller. He is president of the Piedmont Environmental Council, an environmental organization focused on conservation issues in the Piedmont region of, of Virginia. We thank you for being here, sir. Thank you, Congressman Markey. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf uh, of the Piedmont Environmental Council, but also for land trusts and land conservation organizations uh, throughout the country. We're a very active member of the Land Trust Alliance and working hard on this issue with them, and they have asked us to express some of their concerns. I have a couple of maps uh, which I hope the staff can put up because I think they'll help instruct this conversation. Uh, we appreciate the time and attention that this committee is taking to consider the complex issues associated with transmission. Mm -hmm. We appreciate the willingness of the committee to deal with the transmission as part of a broader energy policy and not as an end in itself. From our perspective, transmission is only a tool for moving electricity from the source of generation to the end user, but much more important are the policies that will reduce demand for electricity, modify peak demand so that the need for generation Close, uh, and transmission infrastructure is minimized, and encourage clean generation close to load centers, which will reduce the losses of energy caused by long distance transmission. For in the end, the high voltage transmission lines with towers that can exceed 180 feet in height and wide rights of way are, part of an energy are the part of the energy system with the largest footprint and often the most dramatic impacts on communities that lie along them. The transmission system has the potential for substantial land use impacts, including impacts that directly conflict with federal, state, and local policies to protect and enhance important natural and cultural resources. In the brief amount of time I have, I want to focus on a couple issues that have not been raised yet. The first is the assumption, uh, the assertion that the only way we can meet national and state goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to increase the role of renewable sources of energy is to build a national transmission grid. And one, one example of this grid is, is up, up here. This is a, the grid proposed by AEP for the 765 kV system uh, that would link resources. It, it was originally overlaid over wind uh, resources. Uh, but in fact, the correspondence with coal resources is, is actually higher uh, when you, when you go, actually go and see where those lines are laid out. And that's one of the causes of concern is that, that in fact what you'd be doing by doing a transmission loaded uh, a set of incentives is in, in fact encouraging greater transmission of coal fire generation uh, than in fact of renewables. And the reason for that is that nowhere in, a, in, in the legislation do we recommend a change in the economic dispatch rules that govern which generation is brought online first. You know, all the renewable goals notwithstanding, uh, we dispatch energy by price, and the auctions are by price, and we've heard lots of calls for competitive pricing. But the potential that that will, in fact, increase the amount of, of, of tra transmission that is carrying uh, coal-fired emissions, and in fact, from the dirtiest and oldest plants, uh, is very real. Unless this committee can also ensure uh, that before that transmission is made available, we are in fact putting in the carbon cuts 
uh, through the carbon and cap and trade and otherwise uh, governing the emissions of grandfathered coal plants that have never, never reduced their emissions, there's a very real possibility on the, in the eastern interconnect that the gains that have been made by REGI, the 45 million tons or so of, of carbon emissions reductions, could be offset. Uh, a second an issue that has not been addressed so far is, is the issue of peak versus average uh, demand. Peak, the, the transmission and generation uh, system is being designed to meet peak loads. And the more we can do to reduce peak loading, uh, the less we have to build uh, across our landscape. And so uh, it's very important that this committee address the, the fact that transmission planning that has been done to this point uh, really hasn't addressed the full incorporation of some of the policies that are in the, uh, in the ACES legislation. They have not taken into account the amount of demand side management that, it, that is recommended and, in fact, assume a level of per capita of electricity use that steadily increases over time rather than is reduced. The final thought uh, is, is this. To the extent that transmission is necessary, and obviously connecting some renewables will require transmission, it's very important to respect the other public policy values that are, are, are out there and particularly related to the lands that have to be crossed by transmission. We should be seeking to avoid, wherever possible, the natural resources, the historic resources, the cultural re resources, and yes, even the landscapes that America values so much. Current legislation uh, draws a distinction between publicly owned lands and privately owned lands, and that's something that I think this committee needs to look at hard. Uh, east of the Mississippi, most natural resource lands, most re uh, historic lands are privately owned, but protected through public-private partnerships, whether it's the designation of historic districts or the donation of conservation and historic uh, easements. Those easements are often approved by, by state uh, government. In the case of Massachusetts, hundreds of thousands of acres are actually individually approved each time by the Attorney General. The same is true in the state of Virginia. And they are due all of the respect that a national park, or a national wildlife refuge, a state park would be due. So as you think forward on those transmission lines that have to be built, make sure that we're avoiding the, the resources, the private resources, as well as the public resources, and make sure that we mitigate and compensate it for the impacts on those resources. Thank you, Mr. Miller, very much. And uh, our final witness is uh, David uh, uh, Jose. He is the President and Chief Executive Officer of CMS Energy and Chief Executive Officer of its principal subsidiary, Consumers Energy. We welcome you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you also for pronouncing my name properly. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. It took one minute up here to get it right, but <laughs> uh, I wanted to that. make sure, huh? I appreciate the opportunity to address the uh, subcommittee this afternoon. Uh, Consumers Energy, our principal subsidiary, serves 1.8 million electric customers, 1.7 million natural gas customers in the lower peninsula of Michigan. Uh, I would suggest that we have a bit of a unique opportunity, having uh, developed, owned, and operated uh, transmission assets along with distribution and generation assets for a century. Consumers Energy now no longer owns transmission assets. We sold our transmission system in 2002, and it is now independently operated. Uh, we therefore appreciate the difficulty in citing new transmission and support federal backstop authority for new interstate lines as a last resort. We also see a need for new transmission in Michigan to interconnect new wind resources that are being developed in the Thumb in particular and along the Lake Michigan shoreline as part of the Renewable Portfolio Standard compliance effort in the state of Michigan. We believe new transmission development should meet three key common sense principles. Number one, benefits of proposed projects should exceed the costs by a reasonable margin. Number two, proposed projects should be similar or should be superior to other alternatives, which would include other transmission solutions, distribution solutions, perhaps lower voltage transmission solutions, and generation solutions. And finally, costs ought to be fairly ad allocated to the beneficiaries uh, of, the, uh, of the project as determined through the planning process. I would concede that these principles are complex to apply and therefore need an independent planning authority of some sort to apply them. Uh, a regional transmission organization or a group of RTOs, for example, 
to conduct the evaluation. Uh, they cannot be objectively performed by market participants, including independent transmission owners that have a vested interest in new transmission. In our view, overly generous FERC incentive policies have created a rush to invest in transmission, often not justified on a cost-benefit basis. I provide some specific Michigan examples within my written testimony and won't go over those now. Fortunately, for new intrastate projects in Michigan, we have a certificate of need process that fully vets these projects before allowing condemnation. I suggest that might be a, a model that is appropriate at the federal level as a federal backstop. Now there are proposals to build massive new uh, high voltage infrastructure over the entire eastern interconnect, the so-called overlays. Part of that, a $3.2 billion, 765 kV project largely in Michigan has already been evaluated by the Midwest Independent System Operator and determined not to meet a cost-benefit test for the State of Michigan. A number of independent system operators and planning authorities in the Eastern Interconnect recently studied a joint coordinated system plan that was referred to earlier involving a $56 billion high voltage overlay. Some have referred to it as the equivalent of constructing the interstate highway system. That study concluded that Michigan would receive virtually no benefit at fairly large cost. Looking just at consumers' customers, if costs were spread on a, quote, postage stamp basis to all our customers, we would pay about $159 million a year of increased cost for roughly a $2 million annual benefit. I would submit that Michigan simply can't afford that. Another 10 to $12 billion project that has been proposed to bring wind power from the Dakotas to as far east as Chicago, of course, does not reach Michigan. But further, when the cost of that transmission is included in the equation, Michigan-based generation is less expensive to develop. On that score, we, develop, we, we agree with the 10 Northeast and Mid-Atlantic governors uh, with regard to the potential implications on developing renewable resources locally. Let me be clear, we don't object to such projects if the benefits exceed the cost by a reasonable margin, region, reasonable alternatives have been considered, and the costs are spread appropriately to the beneficiaries. That might be, for example, Dakota wind developers or purchasers of that power who need to meet their own standards. Finally, Michigan transmission rates today are four times what they were in 2002 when we sold the system. Even without these overlay projects, we are forecasting they will increase by another 50 percent from today's rates over the next six years. Transmission investment is occurring in the State of Michigan. We don't feel that FERC rate making oversight currently is sufficient in states where transmission is independently owned and therefore not subject to State regulatory oversight. That situation, along with overly rich incentives, are causing, in our view, transmission development that is sometimes not in the best interest of our customers. In summary, we think tra targeted transmission investment is needed, both in Michigan and nationally. We believe that planning and evaluation by RTOs or groups of RTOs that are independent from market participants is an appropriate way to pursue that. And we think three key principles need to be followed. One, benefits exceed costs by a reasonable margin. Two, reasonable alternatives have been considered. And three, the costs are appropriately allocated to the beneficiaries. Thank you again. Thank you. <clears throat> and we thank our uh, entire panel. Now I'm going to turn to recognize the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, uh, thank you. First, I'd like to uh, put into the record a, a white paper which is quite instructive. It's called Entitled Green Power Superhighways, provided by the American Wind Energy Association and the Solar Energy Industries Association, Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, if I'm without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chair, yeah. and I uh, appreciate that. Uh, and this white paper does confirm what some of the witnesses talked about, which is that, that we've we've got 300,000 megawatts of wind projects uh, waiting in line, essentially, to connect to the grid. And they point out that the lack of transmission capacity is also hindering states' ability to meet multiple renewable energy goals, and it just confirms what several of the witnesses have testified today. I want to ask Mr. Detchen um, about the, the greenhouse gas interconnection standard that your, your proposal has incorporated. It, it basically would essentially allow Federal backstop authority 
uh, it would encourage it in relationship to those sources that are low and zero greenhouse gas emitting generators. Could you tell us how you envision that working? And, and by the way, would it help in at least some sense some of the concern of the northeast states who don't want to see their offshore wind projects intruded upon by, say, uh, uh, if we can call it dirty sources from far away intruding on their, on their corridor? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think there is a lot of confusion about uh, how a greenhouse gas interconnection standard would work. In the first place, it is an interconnection standard. It doesn't govern what electrons are the line, on the line because, as everybody has pointed out, you can't distinguish between green and brown electrons. But it, if we are going to provide some additional uh, authority uh, to uh, site and, and pay for uh, special new transmission lines to benefit renewable energy, uh, let's uh, make sure that the uh, generation that is hooked up to it is not conventional coal. And so what we have suggested is that since you are going to need probably gas to balance renewable energy on these lines, that up to uh, a single cycle gas turbine uh, uh, emission level would be acceptable to connect to these lines, uh, but above that would not. Uh, and that seems like a fairly straightforward uh, way to approach that. With regard to uh, the uh, question of competition with uh, uh, local resources, I think what, what should be important uh, and I think inevitably would happen if the states are driving this planning process, even on an interconnection-wide basis, is that uh, they take into consideration state policies considering local resources and use delivered prices, as was mentioned in the last panel, as the basis for comparing different resources. I think that is a very straightforward way to make sure that the competition is fair. I will ask you what I hope is a rhetorical question, but in the bill that I have introduced, we have tried to preserve the bottom-up planning so that the states and regions really do the planning rather than a cram down from the Federal Government. Do you no, think that is a fair characterization of the, the proposals that we have made? No, absolutely. I th and I think that uh, there is uh, there's been a lot of talk about top-down or federal uh, intervention here, but I think the legislation uh, that you've proposed, Congressman, uh, establishes a mechanism for states to work collaboratively addressing these regional issues and that those decisions will uh, be executed uh, with the assistance of FERC, but FERC would only be able to step in if the states are unable to reach a plan. And could you suggest any other solutions to the concern um, that the gentleman from Massachusetts e expressed about this offshore wind being crowded out, if you will? I perceive that this greenhouse gas interconnection standard would help solve that problem because it would essentially allow the use of the Federal backstop authority for clean sources, green sources of energy. And I think that would help solve that problem. Do you agree with that, and is there anything else that you could suggest that, that, that would help solve that concern? Well, uh, I think that uh, a, a stronger step, which uh, Mr. Miller suggested, would be to uh, have federal intervention on the loading orders uh, for uh, the use of different kinds of resources. I doubt that that would be politically uh, saleable right now. So I think that within the context of what's, what's doable, I think that the approach you have outlined is, is about as strong as it could be. And I, I might add that I think that uh, the greenhouse gas standard, uh, to a certain extent over time, gets overtaken by the requirements of the cap and trade legislation, assuming that that is enacted. Uh, but I think your legislation reflects that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your cooperation. The, the gentleman's time has expired. The Chair will recognize himself now for a round of questions. Um, let us go down the line. <clears throat> And each of you could answer yes or no. Do you support giving FERC the authority to modify any transmission plans that are established through bottom up regional planning processes? Mr. Izzo. I would not. You would not. Mr. Mr. Joes. Nor would I. Okay. Mr. Nipper. No, sir. No. No. Mr. No. Uh, I think that if the plans are developed by a broad 
uh, array of states in the way we're describing, I would agree no. No. Yes. Mr. Walsh? Uh, bottoms up is each state brings it up, or um, how, how do you envision that? Regional planning process, yeah, that's agreed to by the state. Should the, should the FERC be able to modify a regionally agreed upon plan? If the planning process is independent, no. If the planning process is not independent, yes. Not independent meaning? That uh, it's influenced by market participants. Uh, and other political entities. Uh, the planning process, to me, uh, being in the even if the for, even if the the state governor, the state governments agreed to it. I believe that all the transmission within the state that is not regional in nature should the state should have as much authority over it as they want. When we develop regional transmission, which is for the good of the region or the good of the country. Right. Should the FERC be able to override that regional plan agreed upon by the states? I stand by what I said. If it's done by an independent planning authority, yes. I'm saying no, and if it's not, yes. Mr. Miller? Uh, I think one of the concerns we, we would have if FERC were involved, that the, uh, the right of appeal ought to be not only limited to the transmission proposers, but also those, those with, with, with other perspectives. Right now, under those circumstances, you would give FERC the authority to modify a transmission plan? Well, I think there, there are legitimate federal issues with, with anything involving interstate transmission. But, but, but if you are going to create that, it ought to be uh, equally available to both the proponents and those that have concerns. Okay. Uh, let me ask, let me get on the line again. How many of you would support a greenhouse gas interconnection standard of the type proposed by Mr. Inslee? Um, can we go down and ask how many of you would support that? I would not for the simple reason that a greenhouse gas interconnection standard does not speak to existing carbon intensive generation being able to piggyback. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Jose? Yeah, I, I have to qualify my answer. I'm not 100 percent sure uh, the specifics of the standard. I haven't read them. I would say we have, of course, standards for interconnecting all kinds of renewable capacity already. I would not be supportive of something that limited the use of the transmission line to, to uh, certain types of, uh, of technology simply because I agree with what's been said earlier that you can't label the electrons. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Nipper? No, sir, we would not support you that. You would not. Mr. English? I believe that the bill in itself, and since this is going to be part of the legislation, the bill in itself takes care of that issue. So, no. No. Yeah. Mr. Welsh? I know you do support it, Mr. Uh, Mr. Welsh. Um, uh, with my company, we're an independent transmission company. Uh, you, you make the policy, we're going to support the policy. Thank you. Mr. Miller? I, I think it's an interesting concept when applied to lines that feed into the grid, um, but unfortunately the, the authorities that are being discussed would apply to transmission that's not simply for bringing new generation onto the grid, but, but for expansion of the grid as a whole. Okay, thank so you. And, I would have to say no. Okay, and I'll let you answer for the record, Mr. Dutchon. Well, I, I, just to uh, touch on these two points, we are talking about specially uh, authorized renewable energy transmission lines that would be feeding into, into the larger grid, not to the uh, larger grid. And, and I agree with Glenn that uh, if this is attached to H.R. 2454 and enacted, uh, then some of the reason for it goes away. But there is always the possibility that this will become disconnected from that bill. And as a freestanding measure on transmission, we think that uh, a greenhouse gas standard would be important. Um, how many of you would uh, limit federal authority to only lines that affect uh, renewable electricity that is uh, generated? How many of you would limit federal authority just to that? I would do quite the opposite, Mr. Chairman. I would limit federal siting authority to lines that affect reliability. Reliability. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Jose? Well, I would, re I would limit federal authority as uh, only a backstop provision uh, and uh, rely on uh, local and regional planning as the primary mechanism. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Nipper? Assuming, <coughs> excuse me, sir. Assuming the uh, backstop authority, no, we wouldn't uh, limit that. You would not limit. Okay. Mr. English, would you limit? And again, backstop. Okay. Mr. Dutcher, would you limit it just to renewables? Uh, what I would say is that uh, if we are going to create special new authorities, they ought to be targeted at the problem, which is renewables. Okay. Mr. Welsh. Um, 
I would not uh, limit the federal backstop okay, signing. Thank authority. you, Mr. Miller. Uh, I, th I think we, we we would support limiting it and also respecting the Fourth Circuit opinion uh, that we were involved in. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Izzo. Do you support uh, <clears throat> um, federal backup siting authority for lines for any reason other than reliability? No, I would not. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, that first map which Mr. Miller put up that showed very rich wind resources along the east coast of the United States, uh, with the exception of some portions of uh, the Great Lakes and out on the west coast? It looks like it's the, it has the greatest potential for renewable electricity generation in our country. You are absolutely right, Mr. Chairman. And as uh, I may have mentioned, we are pursuing a 150 megawatt wind farm. And as you mentioned, we can do that 20 miles out and still be in 140 feet of water. That is not, that's not to underestimate the challenges of construction and operations and maintenance costs. But we expect to fully bear the cost of the short haul transmission and would, would, would be opposed to having a, a nationwide support for a long haul transmission and be unfairly disadvantaged. Well, what, what could happen if, if we take Mr. Miller's <clears throat> charts, I guess they're not Mr. Miller's charts, they're AEP's um, maps that have been put together. Is that right, Mr. Miller? The, the, the transmission map is AEP's. We overlaid it on wind and then coal resource maps. Mm -hmm. um, if there, that transmission plan was implemented, it would bring that transmission line in from the Midwest very close to the East Coast. What impact might that have on your planning for um, renewable electricity off of the coastline or other parts of New Jersey? We would stop planning for that. Why would you stop? Well, because we would not be able to be competitive with the cost of the wind if it is not burdened by the cost of transmission. So the, so the wind from the Midwest, if it does not face a transmission charge, would be cheaper in that case. Now, you are up in the Great Lakes. Um, Mr. Joes, could you talk about that as well in terms of the potential renewables coming in off the Great Lakes and what impact that could have for uh, Michigan and what could happen if instead power is wheeled in from other parts of the country through federal preemption, federal eminent domain takings? All right. Well, it's it's a bit similar, but maybe two aspects uh, uh, to what Mr. Izzo has said. First of all, the, it's clearly windier, windier in the Dakotas, for example, than it is in Michigan. Michigan has wind resource even on land, but it's not as windy in the Dakotas. So instead of 42 percent roughly capacity factors, you might see in the range of uh, 30 percent capacity factor. However, once the cost of transmission to get the power from the Dakotas to Michigan is taken into account, it is cheaper to develop it in Michigan. Now, you, you mentioned offshore. Michigan does have a very strong offshore wind resource. Unfortunately, offshore is still uh, about twice as expensive to develop than onshore resources. And so when that uh, calculus is taken into account, uh, we think it makes more sense to develop the onshore resources in Michigan first. Now, you heard the earlier testimony about <clears throat> the problem getting uh, renewable energy resources from the Dakotas over to Minnesota and the blame being laid at the feet of the Federal Government. Uh, in that region, do you believe that is one of the main problems, that otherwise the regions have been able to harmonize their electricity uh, transmission policies in a way that is viewed as fair to all states? Well, I, I'm not familiar with specific Federal Government problems that may have come up in, in, in Minnesota. My observation is that the regional planning process has been effective uh, and is a good solution to, uh, to, to the problem. I think, as many of us are pointing out, uh, you warp the economics when you start putting effectively free transmission or postage stamp transmission along broad regions and then you change the economics dramatically rather than having them uh, compete on a standalone basis. Now, for our audience, when we say postage stamp, what are you referring to? Well, why is the phrase said postage stamp? Why is the phrase postage stamp used? Effectively, what a postage stamp rate is, and it's used as an analogy to the federal postage postal system where you put a stamp on a letter and you send it anywhere for the same price. You could send it from the Dakotas to New Jersey exactly. for the same price. The reality, of course, is the costs are not the same. And when we look at the cost of transmission to move power from west to east, 
there is a significant cost involved. However, uh, if that cost is ignored and everybody pays the same price regardless of how far it moves, it changes the economics. And yes, Dakota Wind would then be uh, more economic on that basis once the cost of transmission is ignored than Michigan or the East Coast. We don't think that is the right way to look at it. Yeah, and, and one of the things that we are really trying to accomplish, obviously, in the Waxman-Markey bill is to generate renewable electricity and renewable energy jobs generally in all 50 states. So Mr. Izzo here has a plan to, uh, along with many other people in New Jersey, to generate um, you know, new renewable energy jobs that help with the employment uh, in his company, but in the state of New Jersey uh, as well. Um, and we don't want to invoke the law of unintended consequences here uh, and have a great revolution, have a standard that is imposed upon New Jersey and then not have the jobs created in New Jersey, especially if they have the richest renewable energy resource right off their shore. Mr. English. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I think you are making a good point, but, but I would also suggest one other thing, that it might make more sense in light of the objective of the legislation, in light of the fact that we are entering into a little different world than we have in the past, that really what we are trying to do here is maximize the amount of renewable energy that we get produced all over this country. Now, the fact of, of whether it is produced in one state versus another state, as long as it is the most cost-effective way in which we can produce it and we can, in fact, make use of it all across this nation, I would think would be the ultimate objective. Now, I can understand why some folks may want to look at this very localized and, and maybe a very parochial thing, but this is a national piece of legislation and we are trying to achieve a national objective and the thing that is limiting us to be a, being efficient is this transmission system. Absolutely. And, and, and by the way, we couldn't agree more on this, okay? So if, if you're looking at, at, at this map and the fact that we're talking about along the coast mm -hmm. and they may have more wind there, uh, then obviously we ought to be looking, that's where we ought to produce it and we should use that most cost effectively and that's what we should be the driver and where we go. If we can't do that and we have to do it out in, in the Dakotas, then fine, do it in the Dakotas. But it shouldn't matter whether it's off the coast of Massachusetts or in the Dakotas as long as we're meeting the nation's needs. And we're going to have a huge amount of power that is going to be necessary to come from renewable energy if we're going to meet these objectives as outlined in the legislation. And one quick point, I know uh, I've got a home down in, in South Carolina. It's up on a mountaintop. We've got a huge amount of wind up there. But I can assure you, if you try to build a wind generator up on that mountain, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to be very, they're going to be objecting to it, unlike what you'll find a in the Dakotas. Absolutely. So I, I think the point that Mr. Izzo is making, and Mr. Joe's as well, is that using this postage stamp, stamp analogy, uh, it doesn't cost 47 cents to really move a letter from New Jersey to New York City. Okay probably cost less, but the average is 47 cents so that someone from South Dakota can mail a letter into New York City uh, and that we have this communications across the whole country. And that's great. We accept that. Uh, it's the way it should be. What Mr. Izzo is saying is that if you do the same thing for electricity and you make it the same price to transmit electricity in from the middle of America, to New Jersey, uh, as it would be to bring it in off the coastline of New Jersey, then that's going to undermine the economics of all the projects along the East Coast because it hasn't factored in how much it costs to transmit that electricity 1,500 miles uh, all the way into the East Coast market. And so the question then becomes how many new jobs will be created along the East Coast of the United States? Uh, if there is no incentive uh, any longer for Mr. Izzo uh, because he's almost bound by his, uh, his obligation to his shareholders to take all of this very inexpensive but subsidized electricity coming in from the Middle West. So how do we square this circle, Glenn, so that uh, Mr. Izzo and Mr. Joes and others aren't 
and disincentivized to produce uh, renewable electricity within their own service areas. Broad-based fair rates, that's basically what you're talking about. The people that are receiving the power, that are using the power, are paying the cost. That's what it really comes down to. If, if you're not talking about mailing that letter from the Dakotas to some other region of the country and you're talking about instead what it costs to actually mail that letter to that location, that's the real issue that you're coming down to. And Mr. Izzo, what would you respond to that? So, so I, would, I would say that if I looked at just this last year alone, the price difference associated with transmitting power from the Plains states to New Jersey, depending upon how busy the transmission wires were, ranged from $20 to $80 a kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. Typically it was $30 to $40 a mm -hmm. kilowatt hour. That means it would be cheaper for a customer in New Jersey to use a wind farm operating 25% of the time than to use a wind farm operating in the Plains 40% of the time because it's the total cost that matters. If you eliminate transmission, mm -hmm. then suddenly the 40% time of the N Dakota farm looks cheaper, but you've put a burden on the American taxpayer and you've ended our economic development in our region. Uh huh. Well, well, we want to be fair here though, right? I mean, that's our goal of the bill. We want, we want to incentivize renewable, you know, this green energy revolution should be everywhere, not just in certain parts of the country. So we need to find a way then to make sure that we don't invoke this kind of consequence <clears throat> uh, that undermines economic development in states that have incredible resources indigenous to them. And that's a, that's a real difficult problem here and something that we have to uh, work through. Uh, I apologize to everyone. Uh, I really could spend the whole afternoon with you and Next week I might spend an afternoon with each one of you uh, in working out uh, this uh, issue because we have to be fair. Uh, we have to be fair. We have a big vision, but everyone, every state can actually play a role here. There is actually a role for everyone. And we have to make sure that uh, uh, we render to the East Coast the things that are theirs, the things to the South that are theirs, and the Midwest that are theirs, and the West that are theirs, huh? The prairie, the desert. And Glenn, even as you were saying, you represent 75% of the land mass of the United States. Um, there's an ocean mass, too, that, uh, that is also out there. And we have to fact... Excuse me? We do have coastal co-ops. No, that's what I'm saying to you. And so this, this whole... And so we, I want to make sure those coastal co-ops are able to go out into the ocean and have the incentive to... I'm with you, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me? Yeah, so we have to work out a fair formula. So I thank each of you, and we're going to have to stick very close together over the next couple of weeks so we can have this conversation uh, and reflect what our national goals are, uh, but with each state, each region, uh, and, and the history of each state and region. You know, states that start aren't even states, they're commonwealths, whether it be Virginia or Massachusetts, have their own traditions in terms of what lands are sacred that might not follow the traditional Federal Lands Act, but have just the same impact in terms of the relationship with the history of our states. So I thank each of you, and I'm going to turn over the remainder of uh, the hearing to Congresswoman Baldwin, who will bring it to a conclusion. Thank you so much. And I don't get to sit in this chair very often, but I, I won't make you uh, stay uh, long just because I'm enjoying it. <laughs> um, I, first, a, a quick comment, and, and I, I'm not, um, it, it, I'm construing or interpreting from some of uh, Mr. Welch's testimony that there's a, a frustration with some of the planning um, at, that's occurring at the state level process. And one of the things that I would just point out, um, and certainly we heard some testimony in the first panel about su very successful uh, state level uh, planning. But if you look at uh, uh, Order 890 and this process, it's really relatively new and I think I would argue hasn't been um, yet given the chance to play out. Uh, if you look at the area that I'm most familiar with, um, the first time uh, MISO Order 890 planning um, processes were approved by FERC um, and then subject to additional compliance requirements was on May 15, uh, 2008. And thereafter, they had to do a filing in August of 2008, which was just approved on May 20, 2009. 
Um, so you could make a, an argument that really just three weeks ago this is getting underway and it's a process that's to be given 12 to 24 months to, um, to uh, occur. So I, I, it's, it certainly concerns me to have a, characteris a characterization of this uh, state and regional planning processes as not being as being broken or not working when really much of the new focus is uh, subject to order 890 is is just underway um, I, I have one uh, one question for the panel uh, with regard to um, uh, we, it goes without saying that construction of a transmission superhighway will be a moneymaker for um, uh, certain parties involved. And we heard the uh, chairman of FERC testify about uh, the ec economics of transmission uh, siting and, and, and construction, as well as the guaranteed rate of return. And so I, I guess I'd like to ask you all, what role, if any, should these entities um, with profit interest play in the transmission siting and decision-making process? Um, how should we appropriately limit or not the role that they play? And uh, why don't we go from left to right this time and start with Mr. Miller? Well, I appreciate that question. Uh, that, that's been one of the most troubling aspects of the planning process uh, in the PJM region. Um, the PJM is essentially, from our perspective, a trade association of utilities who are proposing projects and then ratifying the, the proposals amongst themselves. Uh, they do not have a, until very recently, have a process that complies with eight, uh, the FERC Order 890. They were looking only at transmission solutions and not at alternatives. And they do not do the kind of balancing of impacts, uh, you know, other issues of the public interest that state utility commissions uh, more clearly have authority to do. So the current way we do regional transmission planning is, is very disturbing. Uh, the, the owners of the transmission lines propose projects. Uh, there's a reactive approval process, and there's no balancing of, of, of other considerations, even within the, the alternative energy uh, solutions like energy efficiency DSM. They're starting to incorporate those, those things, but the, the process is, is very conservative and, and, and very oriented towards producing transmission solutions. Mr. Welch? Well, the, uh, to go to your question first, you know, the frustration that I feel with the planning process is I would agree with you that um, Order 890 went a long way. But the one thing that we don't have is in MISO or any of the other RTOs, we don't have full participation from all of the affected people. And as a result of that, when you're trying to do regional planning, uh, you're not going to get the, to the solution set that you need, number one. Number two, like when uh, we had problems in 2003 with the largest blackout that affected this country, we finally came to the conclusion that NERC was funded improperly and wasn't independent in their decision making for setting reliability standards. As a result of that, we changed the way NERC was funded. It reports to FERC. It's funded through an assessment through uh, all the utilities. And rather, and, and that assessment is paid to FERC, who then pays NERC. And we've taken the financial incentives of the market participants out of the hands of the RTO, or in this case, the Reliability Council. So when we talk about independent planning, it's not about some kind of closed door deal here. It's about getting the financial impacts off the back of the RTO so that they can do the job that they're there to do. Then when we get to that point, you have the question that says, hey, who should participate and what should be the rates of returns that these companies should earn? I think that the fair thing to say here is that, you know, when you start to build regional projects that everyone's affected by, they should be all participating in as financial investors. This shouldn't be just a one-stop, one-person place, but those people should be part of that investment proposition because they are all there to make the grid work and work con in a concert way. When you build a regional grid, you have to have yourself in a position where you can also maintain it. No one company could ever go across thousands of miles, have linemen, line crews, warehouse facilities, and everything that we need. And so it's going to take the participation of all of those people on the route. But without everyone being there at the table, this gets very tough to do. So when you get to that point, whatever they FERC says is just and reasonable, that's what it'll be. Mr. Dutchin. 
Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, let me suggest uh, a way to think about cost allocation and rate of return together. Uh, under the current system, private companies uh, enter into uh, agreements to provide transmission and they go out and they raise the capital on the markets to do that. So as uh, regulators consider that, they have to uh, provide uh, the cost of that at, at, a, at the high cost of raising that capital and then a rate of return on top of that. If the costs are more broadly shared, first of all, you have a guaranteed revenue flow which will reduce the cost of capital to raise the money in the first place and, in the sec and, and therefore a reduced rate of return to the companies would be justified. So there would be two ways by sharing the cost that you would reduce the uh, cost of building out this transmission, uh, sharing it across a broader uh, range of customers. Mr. English. Well, we've had many complaints about the fact that uh, it's, it's difficult for electric cooperatives to participate in this process, both because of the size and the complexity and the, the type of expertise is required <coughs> to participate independently. But also, I think uh, a lot of it go does come down to this situation that uh, the big entities of the region, quite frankly, are the ones that seem to have the, the control and the influence, or at least to feel that they should. And uh, many of those, uh, so that basically does not have an all-inclusive, broad participation locally uh, in designing uh, uh, many of the systems that, uh, that come forward. So uh, I think there's much work that needs to be done in the improvements in that, and hopefully we're going to see that in the future. But we need a broad-based planning system in place. Mr. Nipper. Yes, ma'am, we would uh, agree with the comments that have been made that it really requires uh, uh, participation by everyone involved, all the stakeholders. That's varied uh, in our members' uh, views about, among regions, uh, some a bit better than others, but it really is necessary that everyone be at the table and, and, and be participating and that their input uh, be, um, be, uh, uh, be accounted. The, uh, I will say that in following up the comment of the uh, RTO and ISO regions, and they vary a bit as well among them, but the uh, opportunities to uh, participate in the, uh, st equally participate in the stakeholder process with some of the other stakeholders for our members leaves a lot to be desired, I'll say that. And, the, um, and then I would just lastly mention the uh, benefits that I mentioned in my testimony about joint ownership. And if there are uh, opportunities, equal opportunities for, for folks, uh, and again, American Transmission Company is a good example of this, uh, uh, where um, uh, an opportunity for um, uh, broad and joint ownership by uh, multiple uh, entities provides planning and other benefits as well. Thank you. Mr. Joss. Well, I might just pick up on something Mr. Miller said. I think that uh, FERC's incentive policies uh, have have created an, uh, a situation where not only independent transmission companies but integrated utilities that hold distribution, transmission, and generation uh, favor investment in transmission for solutions to the problems, even if they're not the most optimum solution. Because frankly, the rates of return uh, uh, are higher and the level of risk are significantly lower than other kinds of investments uh, uh, that might be under state regulatory policy, for example, vis-a-vis -vis what the FERC has put in place. So our concern is you see a rush to invest in transmission. Now, I want to clarify again, there are transmission projects that make sense, and if they make good economic sense, they ought to be supported. I think we have to be careful not to incent investment because of the low risk, high return environment vis-a-vis -vis the uh, public interest. And therefore, I do think broad uh, public planning uh, of some nature is necessary with broad participation. Thank you. And Mr. Izzo. We operate both a regulated transmission and distribution business and an unregulated generation business. And the regulated transmission business provides reliability 99.999 percent of the times through a regional planning process. It works and it works well. And that is regulated and rates are based upon our cost of service. Our unregulated generation business always has to consider the cost of connecting to the grid as part of its investment strategy and fully bears that cost. We need to dispel the notion that renewables are not being built because of the transmission system. Renewables are not being built because we're not sending clear price signals. 
This committee deserves congratulations on doing that through cap and trade and through setting an RES. And now at the risk of being a little flip, the next thing I expect to hear from people is that if only we had refrigerated freight trains running free of charge from the North Pole, our local supermarket would, would get its ice cubes from there. It just doesn't make sense to ignore the transportation charges. I want to thank uh, all of you gentlemen again for your time and uh, expertise and uh, your patience. Uh, before I adjourn, I uh, need to ask unanimous consent that two letters from uh, FERC to uh, uh, Chairman Markey are uh, put in the record without objection so ordered. And with that, our hearing is adjourned. Sure was fun. <laughs>